All right, I'm going to begin this morning, today, this evening session. And just to let everyone know that this is being recorded. So people who join late or who miss the session, or if you'd like to go back and review, you'll be able to see the recording. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Melissa Kang. I am on the Education Committee of the International Association for Adolescent Health. I'm also the Vice President Oceania of the Council of IAAH, and I'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of IAAH to this third of four symposia in which we're hoping to stimulate international discussion about the best ways of educating and training professionals to deliver effective healthcare for the world's young people. Today, we have invited five people in four presentations to share their ideas and experiences. Each speaker, or in one case, two speakers, will have 15 minutes to present, followed by five minutes for questions. So please start typing your questions as they come up in the Q&A box, not chat, but the Q&A box, and we'll try to get through as many of those as possible after each speaker. If we don't have enough time, we'll ask presenters to respond after the session and circulate answers. We've circulated a program for you in the link in the chat, which contains a summary of each presentation, as well as some more biographical details about each presenter. Here you can see on the screen, the titles of the four presentations we'll be hearing from tonight. So before we get underway, I'd now like to invite Professor John Klein, who is the president of IAAH to say a few words. Thank you, John. Thank you, Melissa, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're hearing this from. Uh, I'm actually coming to you from a meeting at the World Health Organization in Geneva, where it is morning. Uh, but it's a pleasure to welcome you to this third in the four webinar series that our um, education committee in the International Association for Adolescent Health has been leading. And... Um, you know, this is one of the activities I think that we focused uh, IAAH's efforts around the Global Forum for Adolescents and the Call to Action for Adolescent Health and Well-Being, recognizing that how we address education and what we do to ensure that competency is achieved so that people not only think about adolescents and the services they provide, but that they provide quality care to the young people that they are working with as clinicians and as educators. The, um, the Global Forum, which took place in October, had more than 9,000 people uh, engaged and led to uh, more than 30 new commitments, about 18 commitments by, uh, by member states, by countries, uh, 10 by donors and foundations, and several by non-governmental organizations and healthcare professional associations, and in fact, the IAAH uh, is part of a, a collective commitment made by uh, the healthcare professional associations in the Partnership for Maternal Child and Newborn Health, or PMNCH, for adolescents uh, and for their health and well being. And, and that joint commitment, including having those of you who are experts in adolescent health, be part of engaging other member societies in countries and working together to help bring health ministries and governments to make the right investments in adolescent health care. Um, you'll hopefully hear more about that as the, uh, the year goes on. Uh, this is a commitment that we've made in partnership with the International Pediatric Association and um, with the International OBGYN organization and some of the international nursing groups. And it's one that we hope will be echoed, whether it's addressing comprehensive sexuality education or mental health or road traffic injuries or any of the health issues that we know are critical when it comes to the importance of engaging young people in both prevention and access to appropriate treatment. So I'm not going to take up much more of the webinar time, but again, thank you for being part of this. And uh, I hope that you'll consider uh, participating directly in some of the IAAH activities over the coming year. And I also want to make sure that we are inviting you to come to the IAAH World Congress, uh, which will be held in Jamaica 
in uh, the Caribbean in November of 2025. So uh, you'll see publicity coming out for that quite soon, but we'll be looking for people to help with a scientific review, developing panels, developing programs and reviewing abstracts uh, and having what will be, a, uh, I think, a wonderful opportunity to join together. We are hoping to have uh, translation and interpretation in at least English and Spanish and hopefully uh, other languages as well. Again, more to follow as those details become known. So uh, back over to you, Melissa. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm going to need to go to the uh, advisory group here at WHO and can't stay for the webinar. But again, it's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. And thank you for the work you're doing. Thanks for that lovely welcome, John, and for making the time out of this busy day that you're having in Geneva. All right, I'd like to now introduce and invite our first Present presenters, so Dr. Preeti Galagari and Dr. Chitra Dinka from India, who are going to talk to you about their workshop. Thank you very much. Over to you. Hello, greetings from the Department of Pediatrics at St. John's Hospital, Bangalore, India. Strengthening competencies in teaching adolescent health. Could you move to the next slide, Preeti? We have the National Medical Commission in India which lays out guidelines for curriculum, both undergraduate and postgraduate. And we have a new revised curriculum that came out in 2018. For the first time, 13 competencies related to adolescent health with recommendations to be implemented across the country were put out for uh, adoption and implementation. But the background was that medical teachers who were to implement this health curriculum themselves most of the time lacked formal training, experience, and sometimes expertise. And in India, at the current time, adolescent health is in a state of transition with many pediatric departments only now raising the age of care up to 18 years. So this workshop that we put together was aimed at improving or strengthening competencies of teachers across all medical colleges and also to set out a model of TOT, that is training of trainers so that they could take it forward. So we have the uh, NMC MCI curriculum brought out in 2018. The next slide, Preeti. Uh, just uh, to draw your attention to the top column, you have listed competencies. You also have some details about how to implement them. And a lot of the methodology is to be used are also listed in the curricular framework, in addition to encouraging integration with other departments like psychiatry, ob neck and community health. So some of the topics covered include normative adolescent development, but also a lot of common problems related to sexuality, nutrition, mental health, going on also to substance abuse, uh, an approach to an adolescent patient in a teen-friendly manner, including the head screening, and visit to the adolescent clinic. So it's a huge 13 number listed competency base with the objective of equipping faculty to initiate and strengthen adolescent health. Uh, we at the hospital positioned this workshop as part of the National Conference of Pediatric Medical Education held in November last year. And this was a standalone pre-conference workshop on the TOT model which implied training, trainers who would take it forward in their own medical colleges. Uh, the topics covered, of course, 
were very uh, useful, practical oriented with a goodie bag of teaching material, PPTs, videos, tools even for student evaluation, role plays on counseling and demos. And we opened it up not just to pediatricians, but to the wider department community uh, listed here. And most of our speakers and faculty were drawn from pediatrics and psychiatry and all had uh, formal, non-formal training in adolescent health over the period of 18 to even 20 years plus. So with that, I request Preeti to take you forward into a brief of the session details. Over to you, Preeti. Uh, thank you, Chitra. I'm Dr. Preeti Galgali. I have been practicing adolescent medicine since 18 years and pediatrics since 30 years. So you see in India, we have huge numbers. In fact, India is the home to the largest population of adolescents in any one country. And we face a lot of time and space constraints. So throughout the workshop, our focus was on developing India-specific doable models of not only teaching, learning, evaluation, but also also of encouraging services, adolescent friendly services to be developed at each of these medical colleges. And as you can see, as it is elaborated on the slide, we had formulated clear objectives, methodology and process for every session. Now, the first session was on establishing and strengthening adolescent friendly health services. In the beginning, we shared a survey result, which involved 25 professionals from a medical college. 85% of them agreed that HEADS was a very important part of the psychosocial history of an adolescent, but only 55% admitted to taking or eliciting HEADS on a regular basis in clinical practice. So what was the gap here? And when we brainstormed the session, they said time was a factor. And we discussed on how to actually shorten the HEADS to a mini HEADS and thus probably a viable solution, though a mini heads has not been really tested in a research scenario. We also discussed about the current adolescent health status and the Indian Academy of Pediatrics guidelines, which are country specific guidelines and give fantastic tips and practical points to establish such guidelines. In the end, we formulated an action plan to include the topics for the theory class, for the tutorial, visit to adolescent clinic, how much time would we spend there? What are the changes in the case sheet required? Like inclusion of heads, inclusion of the last menstrual period, the sexual history, even a family history of non-communicable diseases, which is not currently it, it included in a routine pediatric history. We also discussed about an OSCE format for evaluation in adolescent health. Now, our next session was on tricks and tools, and this involved developing a toolkit of generic and specific tools. The generic tools included the IAP growth charts, the PMI charts, the consent policy, the confidentiality policy of a clinic, and also the specific tools included screening for mental disorders like the Beck's depression inventory, the PHQ-2, the PHQ-9, the SCARE tool for anxiety, and the ASK-4 for screening for suicidal behavior. We also brainstormed teaching and assessment methodologies, which included both subjective and formative assessments. And as you can see in the slides, the toolkit also included orchidometer. It also had laminated material for patient education, like how, when does ovulation take place? How does fertilization take place? How, what is the brain development? And these were found to be immensely useful by all the delegates. So we used multiple methodologies to teach this toolkit. The next session was an interactive session on teaching heads and counseling. So we focused on effective communication skills, the non-verbal skills, verbal and active listening, also on eliciting heads by having a non-judgmental attitude and asking open-ended questions and first responder counseling, including how to really build intervention and how to partner with teachers, peers and parents while counseling. So all these competencies of communication were tested by the delegates by using a checklist. And you can see the mode, the methodology that we used was a role play. Mini heads was also incorporated while in these role plays. So you can see interaction was the key of this session. We talked, we did, and we listened.
Now, the next session was on a very sensitive topic of sexual and reproductive health and medical legal aspects, apart from using different teaching methodologies, which were emphasized on utilizing the cognitive domain, the affective domain, and the psychomotor domain. We also discussed about boundaries and breaches that could occur in confidentiality during teaching this sensitive topic, because most of the undergraduates are adolescents themselves, and they may not be aware of the medical legal aspects. So it was emphasized that they need to be supervised and helped during this particular session. And we would, could probably avoid bedside clinics and talk more through simulated patients, which would reduce discomfort both for the learner and also for the patient. Then the section on adolescent health, it actually mental health, it involved sharing of experience of an interdepartmental tutorial. This was led by the psychiatrist and this involved a lot of innovative teaching learning methods involving Kahoot, Mentimeter, forming a word cloud, doing role plays and also discussing grounding and relaxation techniques. The last session was on teaching anticipatory guidance. We are well aware that there's a long list of anticipatory guidance, the issues to be dealt here. But how do we make it practical? How do we really convey it to the adolescent patient and to the parents? So discussion was done whether we could include a checklist into the patient documents, case sheet, could we prepare information, education, communication material and behavior, change communication material by making posters and putting it up in the adolescent clinic. We also shared links of resources which are freely downloadable and and this was again found to be immensely useful. The Indian Academy of Pediatrics and Adolescent Health Academy, clinical guidelines, recommendations, parenting guidelines, adolescent health training modules, standard treatment guidelines. We also shared links to apps which were developed by the Collaborating and Training Center on Adolescent Health at Lady Harding Medical College. And this included job aids, parenting adolescents, and teenage health guide. We also shared mental disorder screening tools and some fantastic resources from a very own National Institute of Mental Health Samvad resources. We also shared the numbers of national helplines like the child line to report child abuse, mental health for seeking treatment for mental distress, digital detox uh, helpline, and also how to report cybercrime. So you can see the feedback that we received was excellent for most of the sessions and very good for a few. And the overall experience was rated as awesome. So no wonder the wrap up had smiles all over for a job well done. But to tell you, you know, this was a workshop which was done one year ago. And in the last one year, we have had faculty from community medicine coming back and telling us that they have included privacy and confidentiality in every interaction with the adolescent. We have people from medicine department coming up and telling us they have done the same and they would love to start a transition clinic in St. John's Medical College. We have faculty from Kolar Medical College coming and telling us to help them further in establishing an adolescent clinic in their pediatric department. Competencies-based education of adolescent health in medical colleges, establishing AFHS and changes in clinical approach, case files and documentation is needed. Horizontal and vertical integrations are essential with transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary collaborations, sharing of experiences, exchange of ideas, innovations, evaluations, feedback, not only from medical professionals, but also from the parents, from the adolescents themselves are essential and improvements thereby and training experiences. Although we can do so little, Preeti, I don't know if you're aware that you've frozen. We can't, I don't know if turning off your video might help for a minute. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, Preeti. That last 60 seconds, your screen was frozen. So I'm not sure, but I think you were just wrapping up. So thank you both so much for a 
you know, energetic start to this evening, to this today, I should stop saying this evening, uh, to this symposium. Um, and what, what an incredible workshop you've just talked about. We have a question, which is, have you assessed the impact of this training on the actual healthcare experiences of adolescents or young people themselves? And if not, you know, where might that, what might you want to do in that area? Can I take that, Preeti? Sure. Yeah, so basically we are at the starting point of our endeavor here to get adolescents in. in. <laughs> we are still don't even have the 18 year, um, you know, um, registration under pediatrics in many centers. We have uh, faculty who are uh, needing to be familiar with the basics of approach. So we in this uh, program have not yet got feedback, but I can tell you the numbers of teenagers seeing adolescents approaching has increased. So we hope to, uh, you know, get better at quality. <laughs> That's certainly a good start, isn't it, to, to see an increase in actual numbers and access. Um, and obviously your evaluations were fantastic. Um, I just, they might, hang on, it's another question. Um, question is, could you please speak to how you addressed some of those attitudes and biases of health workers that you alluded to or that might have come up in the sessions? Okay, so uh, the bias is basically, uh, it's a, a considered as a super speciality, you need training, you feel that you are not so familiar with the, how to approach them, it takes time and you don't have it uh, provided for. Uh, you need facilities and policies in place which you need to work for. So there are a lot of complex barriers, but I think the most important is the attitude itself, the willingness to just listen and be out there and jump in like we did. So we don't wait for formal training. We have a lot of adolescents in our country and those coming to pediatrics, and we'll be happy to move forward and learn on the job. And that's a good way to start too and get better as we go back. So as you can see, most of our sessions were all interactive and involved a lot of group work. So each group had a facilitator. And as we were going along, we were also addressing the challenges that they faced. So that was, it was a very small group of just 30 people. And, you know, as you can see, we had six facilitators. So there was a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction. And as the biases and the questions were coming up, we were dealing with them on the ground. Thanks, sir. There was an extension to that question. For example, premarital sexual activity. I don't know if you'd like to specifically talk about that or or whether you've answered that question as well. No, definitely we talk about it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, yes, we definitely talk about it. And it it, it is more common than what the statistics say. We know that in practice. And definitely yeah. we do talk about it and we deal with our own mm -hmm. biases first before uh, kind of talking to the adolescent. It's always the thorniest issue, isn't it, in adolescent health? <laughs> okay, look, thank you so much. Uh, I think that is all of the questions. Let me triple check. Okay. Um, wonderful. I, I, I wish, can we all give a round of applause somehow, a virtual one? Thank you so much to you, Chitra and Preeti, for an excellent um, presentation. All right, I'd now like to call our second present presenter, to um to talk to us about shaping young minds one story at a time and this is Dr Sushma B thank you Hello, good morning. Greetings to everyone. It's a very good afternoon from Bangalore. I thank IAAH for giving me an opportunity to be part of this symposium. I have been working with adolescents since the last 18 years. 
my first experience with adolescence was during post graduation for my dissertation yes the main goal was the physical health assessment and medical management but we used this opportunity for health education and life skill training since then i have been working with adolescent students high school teachers and coaches over the years what i have observed is that whenever we had a training session the kids came with a preconceived thought that it would be a boring moral science class and they would be forced to sit for a couple of hours nodding their heads trying to look interested but they would mentally switch off after a couple of slides they feel they know what to do and how to do things in the current scenario of increased screen time short attention span long videos and powerpoint presentations bore the kids and they zone out the most common refrain that i heard from parents and teachers was that the children said i am bored to sit for a moral science class i am not a small kid to listen to everything that you say some young adults said even said don't preach so the teachers and trainers would get invariably very disheartened and this is where i had to educate them about the adolescent brain development we are all aware that the physical brain growth is maximum up to 2 years of age but the cognitive functioning of the brain matures between 10 to 24 years the prefrontal cortex is the last to mature and most of the adult and rational brain traits like impulse control abstract thinking decision making planning assessing the risk or consequence of any behavior starts during adolescence progressive myelination and synaptic connections influenced partly by genetics and partly by the environment can change the trajectory of an adolescent's life this education of the adolescent brain development for the trainers teachers and even parents made a difference to their approach they realized that it is all part of growing up they became more patient and tolerant of the mood swings and defined behavior of adolescents i stumbled upon this idea of using stories as a training tool accidentally initially i would tell stories as fillers when the audio visual equipment malfunctioned or in between sessions to break the monotony of the session then i learned that at the end of a session when i discussed what is the key take home message most of the adolescent students recalled the story first i realized that all of us grew up hearing stories from parents and grandparents and even those stories remain with us even today who doesn't remember the story of the thirsty crow or the hare and the tortoise many a time these stories gave a framework for facing challenges in real life it is said that you cannot be what you cannot see so stories open new doors in young minds they stimulate their curiosity and give wings to imagination listening to the stories of sports person scientists or even personal stories of struggle and how to overcome obstacles gives adolescents hope it inspires them to achieve more push boundaries and explore newer avenues this is my personal favorite story on perspective the most common parenting refrain i hear every day in my clinic is that they don't understand my point of view parents feel they are right and the child feels he or she is right i use this ball in the clinic which is painted half black and half white if you look at the black side you will feel it's a black ball and you're right if you look at the white side you're again absolutely right if you argue that it is a white ball then they exchange places and they are surprised to see the other color this is a live demonstration of looking at things from another's point of view but then the absolute tr truth and reality is that it is neither a black ball nor a white ball you look at it from the top and you see a different picture you see a full picture this has always been an eye opening experience for both the parents and the adolescents and it has helped to reduce conflict and give opportunity for better communication so how do we do it i don't have a fixed list of stories 
I plan the stories based on the length of the session, the training goal and the target audience. It's usually a story a session. The teachers also uh, pick a story and uh, they use the story during the uh, school assembly, which is the start of the day in most of the schools in our country. And they build conversations around the story. Many a times we may have to come up with stories on the spot. These are few pictures from the training sessions that actual training sessions that we have had. I also use open-ended stories so that participants can come up with different endings. And in today's age of Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts and TikTok videos, movies, which are still over one to two hours, they are still attracting crowds, making money and holding people's attention. And that is because of the backbone of the movie, which is a story again. Stories touch the heart of the listener. It is an, and it is this emotional connect which has helped it survive competition from social media. I would like to conclude with these words from Mr. Benjamin Franklin. Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. I am a clinical practice-oriented pediatrician. I am trying to make a diff small difference to every family that I interact with. I am not into data collection and analysis. And what I have shared today has been my personal experience. Every day is a new learning. And I hope I have given you all something to think about. Thank you. I still have a lot of time, so I can take some questions. Thank you so much, Nishma. That that was really, um, it, you know, creativity is at the heart of, of teaching, learning, and in the practice of, of healthcare, I think. So you've shared a really unique um, perspective on that and your involvement in that. So there is a question. Um, I'm wondering how we can use stories to educate and train healthcare professionals. I think that they can also help to change attitudes, which underpins motivation. What do you think? So our experience has been with particularly using storytelling with adolescents. What about your thoughts on using the same techniques with healthcare professionals? Have you had yeah. any experience with that? Uh, in our country, when we use the term healthcare providers, it includes doctors, nurses, and mental health coaches. And mm -hmm. most schools in the, in the country which... Uh, are uh, in the cities at least have uh, a child counselor or ad uh, adolescent counselor. They also come under the bracket of uh, healthcare providers because though they are not actually doing physical health monitoring, they are helping to build the mental health of the community. So what I do is when we when I take classes or when I take training sessions for the teachers, I give them different ideas and the teachers and coaches and trainers, they use different stories from their experience and which is local to their city or village. So they use local stories, local experiences to highlight the importance of life skills. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Another question has come through. Can a general case discussion stand in for stories? Yeah, a general case discussion can also stand in a story, but most of the time, if it's a case discussion, you know the end point. You know uh, where it will lead to. But mm -hmm. when it is an open-ended story, you're giving a lot of opportunities for the participants to come up with different ideas. And when they are in an informal setting, they don't fear being judged. They are more open to give different endings. Thank you. Um, this is a comment rather than a question, but getting people to tell their own personal stories can also be very powerful. Um, I guess I'm thinking about the question that was asked in the last session about evaluation. I mean, I think one can palpate in the room, can't you, the sort of either the energy or the sort of aha moments that might happen when, when people start to tell stories. But I'm wondering about evaluation and what sort of evaluation or feedback you've had from participants in your storytelling workshops. Most of the uh, feedback has been from the adolescents themselves. Mm -hmm. And they have come back and even told me that uh, 
it was the story which started them to think. And the next time I meet them, they want a new story. Mm -hmm. The second thing is a lot of parents and teachers do say that this story, especially about the ball and the perspective, has helped mm -hmm. to reduce their day-to-day -day conflicts in the family. Mm -hmm. Because uh, every day morning when the adolescent uh, wakes up, the adolescent, the teenager always feels he or she is right and the parent feels he or she is right. So this always made them pause and think before responding. They would mm -hmm. rather respond and not react. Yep. I don't have a formal feedback because I didn't mm -hmm. do any Google forms or I didn't take a proper feedback because mm -hmm. most of this uh, training has been on uh, uh, sessions which are planned you know, on a very short notice for a couple of days only. And then yes. uh, we go and take it on the spot. Okay, so here is another comment, I think. Um, it's not a question. Um, just having a quick read. Um, I, I think this is a question for you. Last year in Bengaluru, the bags of school children in a number of schools were inspected by relevant government officials. Some of the bags were found to contain contraceptives and cigarettes. The students were suspended and their parents were called in. This is in a state with no government-led school-based sexuality education. Um, I think the question is how can what you do contribute to, to improving this situation? Bengaluru is a big place with a huge population more than uh, about 1.4 crores is the population mm -hmm. of Bangalore and mm -hmm. uh, adolescents make a significant proportion mm -hmm. what uh, this requires is first initial sensitization of the parents and teachers at school so that they are able to impart the same to the adolescents yep. reaching out adolescents through schools is the most practical way to reach out to a bigger population and start mm -hmm. training them. And most, in fact, the Indian Academy of Pediatrics has now started a program, a specific program called SSS, which mm -hmm. uh, concentrates on the overall health of the school children. This There is a separate session for younger children and a different session for the older children, where the school, uh, we as trainers go to the schools, we pick up uh, we train not just the students, but we train the teachers also so that they can continue the program and the momentum mm -hmm. goes on. And how to say no, how uh, we use role play to show how to say no. And then uh, we also educate them about uh, junk foods, mm -hmm. healthy foods, the importance yeah. of exercise, good sleep and restricted screen time. So the idea is over time, if the program is able to reach multiple schools and more and more teachers and adolescents get trained, then the line of communication is open. Most of the time, the adolescents feel isolated and they don't feel they can trust somebody to open up and share their concerns. So this is the idea to keep the channels of communication open so that they can communicate, they can speak to us and they can uh, get back to us with doubts and uh, we can help them. Fantastic. Thank you. And I think, you know, um, sh sharing that and enabling and empowering teachers to also develop those those techniques and, and feel more confident is, is a way to make this all much more sustainable and having impacts from multiple angles. All right. Thank you. A, a big clap to you as well. Thanks Thank so you. much for your time. We'll move on now to our third presenter for this symposium. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sabrina Chitaka from Uganda. Thanks, Sabrina. Melissa, I'm not able to share my screen. Okay, now I can. Good morning from Uganda. Thank you very much for having me and Today, I'll be sharing about the Friday Adolescent Clinic at Makere University and Mulago Hospital. And the clinic is 
an opportunity for apprenticeship for undergraduates and postgraduate students. Arguably, the most demanding times of our life are when you are an adolescent, but also when you are taking care of an adolescent. So the Friday Adolescent Clinic runs only once a week. We've done this for the last um, 10 years and it's a free clinic. We do mostly general um, adolescent care and we are able to refer those who need um, specific care. Makere University is a 100 year old university and the Department of Pediatrics is probably uh, about 60 years, but we had not had any specific training in adolescent health for a very long time until 18 years ago. Mulago Hospital, which is the national referral hospital, is a 3,500-bed hospital. It's spread all over the Mulago Hill and has various departments. When we started the General Adolescent Clinic, we received support from the ICATCH grant from the American Academy of Pediatrics and Columbia University. And to date, we've seen over 12,000 unique clients, and there have been over 8,000 8, repeat visits. So these are just details of what we do at the clinic, psychosocial counseling, career guidance, school health, vaccinations, and skills health training. Both undergraduates and postgraduate students participate in practicums at the adolescent clinic. They come in and shadow, and for the postgraduate students, because they are already doctors, are able to do uh, the actual clinical work. We also take them to do skills building workshops, and do school outreaches. A lot of this work can be found on our Society of Adolescent Health in Uganda website, which you can visit after. This is an announcement for our next um, skills building training, which is going to be in the December holidays. And the participants of our last um, school outreach are members of the adolescent clinic. We know that adolescents are a diverse population and they have different needs and changing needs. In Uganda, 30% of our population is between the age of 10 and 19. And we focus on adolescents, especially because they are in a transition to become adults and we need to harness their creativity but also ensure that they are well. We always emphasize in the clinic that adolescents are not big children and they are not small adults, and they are a special group of people. And with time, people have understood this uh, important statement. Of course, we know that adolescents have many problems. They have maturation issues, peer pressure, risk-taking, and in my country, 2.8% of our adolescent population have HIV. So we started off our experience in learning how to deal with adolescents at the HIV clinic, which is run by Baylor Uganda. And we started a psychosocial support club that is age differentiated. But soon we had to, you know, deal with other specific, we had residential and non-residential camps. But in order for us to um, share this information with even other adolescents who are not HIV infected, we started the general adolescent clinic. So in terms of um, our support, peer support curriculum, we usually talk about growth and development, we talk about teasing and self-defense. We talk about relationships. It's really anticipatory guidance and ensuring that adolescents have the best choices, but also that the care providers understand how best to provide this care. This is just an example of um, one of the peer group sessions in the HIV clinic, where we also have a drama club and a music, dance, and drama group. 
We talk a lot about transitioning, especially having learned from the HIV clinic, but also now that we have other clinics that have grown, including the diabetes clinic, the asthma clinic, the epilepsy clinic, the neuro clinic, and we are learning how to transition our clients from these pediatric clinics to the adolescent service. And all of them come to see us at the Friday Adolescent Clinic, and we work together with the super specialists in the various clinics as well. It's important for us to empower not only the adolescent, but also the students. And we use, like all the others I've mentioned, when we are examining our adolescents or interviewing them, the HEADS assessment. Um, so growing out of our Friday Adolescent Clinic and the work we've done through the adolescent health care provision, we started the Uganda Society of Adolescent Health. It has 60 members all over the country, including at all the different universities where adolescent health is now a growing uh, training curriculum. One of the other universities, particularly the um, Barara University of Science and Technology, Sabrina, I don't know if you can hear me, but you're just frozen. I'm not sure if turning off your video would help. Did you drop out for a second there, Sabrina? Sorry. Yeah. Melissa, sorry about that. That's all right. Um, Try so again. I was, can you see my slides now? Yes, we can. Yeah, so I was saying that um, in order to empower the adolescents and the students, I actually had one of our medical students present at the National Technical Working Group meeting where she was doing a presentation on how we have used a comic book to improve on uptake of the HPV vaccine. And she did extremely well. So we don't only teach them the theory, but we teach them practical skills on how to be public speakers, on how to advocate, on how to present in meetings that are important for policy change. I know that the WHO has always emphasized building an adolescent competent workforce. And at Makere University, we were able to win a grant where we did multiple trainings um, for our undergraduate students, and now they are national trainers, so they can actually go out and be able to train others in the basics of taking care of an, adoles an adolescent patient. So we are grateful to the WHO. And we look at the competences donut, where we emphasize respect for the adolescent client's choices, a non-judgmental attitude, respecting the individual's dignity, and also understanding adolescents as sources of change and as change agents. So just to show you how much work we've done along the different years, um, we've had various workshops, which are now annual, and we have specific Themes, for example, integrating psychosocial development in clinical evaluation, 
uh, care for the adolescent male. And we've also gone out to different countries, in particular Ethiopia, where we encourage them to also start the Society for Adolescent Health in Ethiopia. These are just different workshops. Because of time, I won't share the details. But I'd like to make an announcement that soon we shall be holding our 12th Adolescent Scientific Conference in Kampala, Uganda in May. And the theme is the life course interventions and approaches in adolescent health. And there are various sub-themes. We've already listed a few um, keynote speakers and we'll be sharing with you the flyer. In terms of supporting the postgraduate students, they've also done, um, they do research because our masters is a research driven masters. So people have done various studies, including HPV vac vaccination completion rates, growth and development among adolescents living with sickle cell disease, causes of inpatient adolescent admissions. And right now we are doing an NIH funded study on SMS reminders for HPV vaccination. We have a postgraduate student working with us. So um, I'd like to thank many of my mentors, my head of department, with whom I have worked by, during this uh, entire journey, and also my parent department, which is the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health, the Baylor Clinic at Mulago, which is the HIV clinic from where I did my PhD training, uh, I mean study, but also the IAH Education Committee. I'd like to specifically thank Dr. Churchill for ensuring that we have this uh, series of symposiums so that we learn from each other. Now, these flyers have been shared over a thousand times. So we produce these flyers locally and share them in every possible place where they can refer to us adolescents. So this includes the emergency ward, the chronic care clinics, and also at school. There are three consultants available. Uh, so my colleague, Professor Nicolette, uh, Dr. Joseph Rujumba, who is actually a social scientist, and then myself. But we work with other providers to ensure that we provide holistic care and treatment to our patients, but also offer appropriate training to our undergraduates and postgraduates. Thank you very much for the opportunity again, and I hope um, we've been able to listen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabrina, and congratulations. What a fabulous um, initiative and you know, really inspiring work. It sounds like it's uh, been very successful so far. So I've got a couple of questions here. The first one is, the work in your locality is very impressive. Can you please comment on more on how it could have a wider impact across Uganda? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. Like I said, uh, Uganda has over 10 medical schools. And as we speak now, that there's one other medical school that has opened a similar adolescent clinic. We collaborate very closely. We have shared all our work on the Society of Adolescent Health website. So any student is able to access the information that we have. And also uh, the Society of Adolescent Health does not only include people from my university, it includes people from other universities. The Technical Working Group for Adolescent Health sits at the Ministry of Health, and there it's a national policy decision-making uh, fit where people are able to share from our experiences. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, there's another question I'll ask, but I also just wanted to make the comment on the involvement of, uh, is it undergraduate medical students and then postgraduate students who are young doctors who all get involved in the clinic. So I think that that really does 
grow the next workforce, doesn't it? The future workforce. It's it's a very sustainable model. Um, okay. The next question is: What were the main challenges in setting up the Friday Adolescent Clinic? Uh, thank you so much. So the main challenge was space and lack of knowledge from the um, the administrators of the hospital to understand that adolescents were a unique and special group. So we had to do a lot of advocacy and negotiation for the administration to believe that we would be able to handle um, this clinic. And we still have just one day a week, but I want to say that our ambulatory care clinic now um, consults us and the ambulatory care clinics include like the endocrine clinic, the chest clinic, the neuro clinic, where they see adolescents. And they are learning that they should refer the patients to the Friday Adolescent Clinic. So it takes a lot of advocacy and training and knowledge. For me, the greatest um, success for me was when the hospital administrator walked in with his teenagers to receive services from the clinic. The other one is on the funding. We don't have much funding. A lot of times we use our own money to do the flyers, to do this and that, but people have come in and supported us. And I appreciate everyone who donates whatever amount of money. The skills building sessions are also, um, they cost money, but we have received people to donate. Sometimes we use our own funding. <laughs> And it's 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 quite a challenge, but for me, it's gratifying to see adolescents growing up. It's now 10 years. Our earliest patients are now in their mid-20s and late-20s, so I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Okay, I think that's all. Well, there might be one more question. Um, yes, there is one more question. I would like to ask, how can other healthcare professionals like uh, laboratory scientists, physiotherapists, pharmacists contribute to adolescent health services? Um, great question. So when we talk about an adolescent uh, responsive workforce, we mean the entire workforce. Because we do send some of our clients to probably get like um our tests in the lab, these lab tests also need to be adolescent responsive. So we've invited um, in-service training opportunities for everyone, and we do give them the tips not to be judgmental, uh, to be kind and respectful, because I keep telling people, these are not your children. You've also gone through adolescence and maybe you are even worse than some of the adolescents that you're describing. But it's, 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 it's working and we are doing our best to ensure that everybody becomes adolescent responsive, including the parents. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay, we're doing well for running on time. Um, thank you so much again, Sabrina. I wanted to just encourage everyone who's uh, joining this symposium to type into the chat where you're from. I, I meant to say at the beginning when I was introducing myself that I'm coming to you from the evening uh, in Sydney, Australia, and it would be, this is a, you know, this is an international association, this is a global event, and we'd love to hear from you as to, to where you're coming from tonight. So please type that in the chat while I introduce our fourth and final speaker for this evening who is Dr. Nahed Jaber. Um, thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. It says I can share my screen because some other are sharing. So can you see my slides now? Yes, we can, thanks. Yeah. So good afternoon, it's uh, here 1 p.m. Uh, in Oman, uh, this uh, beautiful part of the world. First, I would like to start with uh, a big thanks to the International Association of uh, 
adolescent health and special thanks for Dr. Churchill to put together uh, this uh, symposium so we can meet uh, all together, share and learn. Uh, so uh, I will be talking today about the implementation of adolescent health assessment in the patient electronic medical record, DMR. And uh, we'll start with a, a little bit of uh, introduction and some highlights about the background behind the implementation of uh, uh, this uh, module in uh, our um, electronic medical record. But first, I will start with a little bit of uh, geographical features. Uh, so Sultanate of Oman is located in the southeastern corner of the Arabian Peninsula. It borders uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates in the west, uh, Yemen in the south as well, uh, in the east, uh, the Arabian Sea. So uh, basically, uh, the uh, looking at the total uh, population of uh, Oman, uh, so there are uh, around 4.9 million, where uh, the Omanis are 2.8 million and the non-Omanis are around 2 million. Uh, it is considered uh, basically um, a kind of a youth uh, uh, country or youthful uh, uh, MENA, uh, like the Middle East and um, uh, North Africa. Uh, it is uh, the largest uh, youth population in the world where um, in Oman approximately 50% of uh, the total population are below the age of 25. And we will put this in context uh, maybe uh, in the next few slides so to better understand why the focus on uh, this uh, young population and how much uh, they represent uh, uh, as a percentage of the total uh, population. A little bit about uh, um, our hospital here, the Royal Hospital, which is uh, administered by the Ministry of Health, and it is the largest uh, tertiary hospital that provides state-of-the-art uh, of uh, clinical uh, services uh, and um, academic as well, uh, teaching uh, site, uh, and um, with a lot of uh, uh, specialties and uh, sub-specialties. Uh, in addition, I would mentioned that the total number of our, uh, the employees in uh, our hospital is around uh, 4,500, uh, and this is, includes all the disciplines. Speaking about, about the pediatric age limit, as per, per the Omani child law, every um, individual below the age of uh, 18 is considered a child. However, when it comes to the healthcare system here in Oman, the pediatric age limit is defined as a person 13 years or younger. So after their 13th birthday, they will be cared for by the adult physician. And here is the challenge, uh, the big challenge. Where adult physicians provide care for adults 18 years and above, and they never had uh, any kind of uh, specific training in relation to adolescent health. Pediatricians provide care for children up to the age of 13 as well, never had any training uh, and exposure to adolescent health. Until uh, 2016, uh, that marks the implementation of the adolescent health services in the country in terms of the academic and the clinical services and the implementation of the adolescent medicine curriculum in the pediatric residency training program that started as a core rotation. So the Adolescent Medicine Unit founded and established at Royal Hospital in February 2016, and it is the first and only one in Oman and the Arab Gulf region and neighborhood countries. And here where I, I mean in terms of the academic um, training as well the clinical services. Uh, to outreach of many adolescent population to meet the unmet health needs for uh, uh, this age group and to provide uh, the international standard of care for adolescent population. Um, uh, speak here about the uh, Oman Medical Specialty Board, which is uh, the regulatory authority for postgraduate training. It is the autonomous body furthering the growth and uh, um, development for the uh, specialized uh, physicians uh, in many fields uh, to assure the competencies of healthcare uh, professionals. Um, just for, I just, sorry for a second to move this, okay. Uh, speaking about the pediatric residency training program, so the pediatric residency training program in the Sultanate of Oman is are organized under the auspice of the Oman Medical Specialty Board, and uh, it is a four year four years uh, program. And each year we have uh, around uh, some some range between eighteen to twenty new pediatric residents who join the program after completing their medical school. Sorry, it's freezing. Okay, 
So the pediatric residency training program underwent um, um, accreditation review by the uh, ACGME. And then uh, one of the citation back then, uh, it was uh, the lack of uh, the adolescent uh, health services or the adolescent medicine exposure or training in the program. And then after the establishment of the adolescent medicine services, the program was granted. Uh, um, accreditation, the continued accreditation status by the ACGME. So we're happy for that. And this was ha this happened in 2018. Uh, the adolescent medicine rotation, um, as a little bit of description, it's a one block mandatory core rotation that is undertaken by the uh, third year pediatric residents. And uh, the Royal Hospital, uh, the hospital where I practice is the only training site for the uh, uh, adolescent, uh, for the resident, uh, when they uh, join this uh, rotation uh, to be trained in adolescent uh, medicine. So basically, uh, um, our uh, resident, when they come to the rotation, usually um, we consider them as novice learners where they never had any exposure or any specific training in regards to the adolescent health. Uh, so uh, the first exposure will be during uh, this rotation, and this where the 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 major problem was uh, identified. And over the last uh, like six years, uh, we have uh, almost uh, trained around uh, 135 pediatric residents uh, who they have passed and completed uh, the uh, uh, rotation uh, in adolescent medicine. And uh, they go, of course, uh, through um, a series of uh, uh, um, academic uh, evaluation, including the didactic teaching and the clinical services. As for the health assessment, which is the core pillar for education and training in adolescent health, so when they arrive to the rotation, basically we can say like the heads is not really in their heads. And this is what I usually uh, tell the resident, like uh, when they join this rotation, like the heads assessment is uh, our status quo. Uh, so definitely um, there, there are lots of uh, resources when they can access the heads assessment. But then in training as novice learner, we were thinking and brain, brainstorming about a, a better uh, platform or format uh, to make them grasp uh, the concept uh, to help uh, them navigate. Um, and uh, develop uh, the required uh, skills and uh, knowledge uh, as they uh, go through the rotation. So it was very challenging for the novice learner to conduct the, the, uh, the assessment without a structured framework. And then we needed to incorporate the heads assessment in our um, um, electronic medical record. So here the challenge uh, came where the pre-existing format of patient assessment in our electronic medical record doesn't capture the required domain for the adolescent assessment. We don't have an available database specific to adolescent population. And then poor quality of the assessment by trainees if we consider them novice learner unless they are directly supervised, in addition to the uh, time consuming for proper documentation and keeping track of for subsequent follow-up without a structure. So the purpose of the project was to incorporate the health assessment in our electronic medical record and to create a structured module to capture all the health determinants specific to adolescent population. It will serve as a teaching and training in the, in the process of their learning, uh, the time management in addition to creating database. So basically this is an example how our uh, usually note will be displayed in our electronic medical record, just a random. Um, uh, blanket uh, uh, template that doesn't capture all the domains we want for the health assessment specific to the adolescent population. So we sat together and then we wanted to create um, a module that is uh, uh, user-friendly, accessible, comprehensive, holistic, adaptable to capture all the domains in the health assessment and to reflect on the consultation details, including the confidentiality statement, uh, some demographic features, uh, in addition to um, uh, other uh, details in, the, uh, dom in all the domains of the health assessment. Uh, including uh, um, uh, how the adolescent is functioning in multiple areas, uh, either uh, uh, in home, education. Uh, it's a very uh, thorough one, as we all know. So the challenge was how to incorporate all the, these information as a first draft, we did it on a work document, but how this can be projected in our electronic medical record and how we can uh, uh, implement uh, this in our, in our um, uh, electronic medical record. So working together with... Uh, 
the IT department at the hospital level and at the Ministry of uh, Health uh, level. We went through lots of uh, series of meetings and the brainstorming, and then uh, we decided to create a kind of a self-explanatory module with a drop-down menu, including uh, multiple uh, questions that will direct the trainees about the type of questions, the quality of the questions they may ask. And here I will go through uh, to show you like a quick tutorial uh, recorded by my voice. I apologize for the quality. Um, I'm not a high tech person, uh, but then I will try to uh, to play the video so you can see how uh, this uh, uh, module was implemented in our uh, system and uh, how it does look like. Okay. And here is a short uh, tutorial uh, to show you how the module uh, was implemented uh, and how it was projected in our electronic uh, medical record uh, to enable uh, a resident uh, work through um, a structured framework and help them processing their thoughts where when they are conducting uh, uh, those type of uh, assessment during their uh, <coughs> rotation uh, in the adolescent medicine. Uh, so as you can see here, the confidentiality statement, uh, and then uh, the young person was seen alone for part of the assessment or for the entire assessment. We move on uh, to the uh, uh, segments uh, of the head assessment uh, uh, where um, uh, there is a drop down menu for each uh, domain uh, to reflect on uh, the performance of the adolescent on those domains. Uh, so here is an example of uh, the questions uh, the uh, trainee or the resident may ask in regards to home and uh, in regards to education and employment, eating and exercise and uh, uh, moving forward to reproductive health, uh, mental health, uh, uh, screen time. And uh, here on this side of uh, the screen, they can document all uh, the information uh, they are gathering during uh, uh, the uh, assessment. We move on to the physical exam uh, and physical assessment, uh, the uh, general appearance physical exam. And uh, the other segment is the care network. Uh, uh, here it includes uh, the parents and guardian, school staff, uh, healthcare, welfare. And then we move on to diagnosis, uh, risk factors, protective factors, action and follow up whether uh, this uh, visit uh, we needed to do any blood investigations, uh, we, did we need to refer to any other subspecialty and uh, what is uh, our plan for the subsequent uh, follow up. Uh, so um, this uh, module, it uh, helps uh, the resident uh, uh, to work uh, through a structured uh, framework and uh, help them uh, process uh, their thoughts uh, and to conduct better quality of uh, assessment, uh, provide better quality of care and definitely uh, better quality of uh, training uh, and education in the field of adolescent medicine. Thank you. Yeah, so this was basically uh, because um, uh, I don't have the ability to show you in real time how does it look in our system for the confidentiality. So I had to record this uh, short clip uh, to highlight uh, how does it look uh, like in the electronic medical record. Uh, so it's a systemic, uh, systemic, uh, systematic framework for the resident and the other trainees to enhance their learning experience and allow them to complete the assessment in timely manner, better quality of assessment, and as a result, uh, definitely better quality of care, and uh, it provides a large database for research projects. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Uh, that's um, that's very impressive. I Thank I work you. in a service that also a few years ago now built in a heads assessment in the EMR. However, it's 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 actually looks very primitive compared to what you just showed us. But I I will say that this year, in fact, we I, I had a, a medical student doing a research project evaluate our services preventive healthcare in the service, which is mostly nurse-led. And um, with, head, with HEADS assessment, because it was built into the EMR like that, even though it's not as not as fancy as yours looks, um, we scored 100% every single client, and we're talking about nearly 600 over a couple of years, um, had a HEADS assessment done, not necessarily by a doctor or a nurse, often by 
uh, an intake worker or one of our social workers. So it, it really makes a difference to have it built into the system. Um, so yeah, congratulations. So the question, a couple of questions. Um, is this EMR linked with the hospital EMR and follow up of that? Um, can it be shared or purchased by others? Well, yes, it is uh, it, like it's within the internet uh, of, uh, on, of our hospital and uh, can be shared. I think uh, this is something, uh, you know, it, it went through lots of approvals uh, because it is uh, difficult uh, to, to introduce a new module. So it took me around a year until mm. it's uh, implemented in uh, in our system. Uh, mm. Well, definitely it has to go through uh, maybe a sequence of approvals from uh, the hospital side for the copyrights as well. Uh, yes, it does belong to the Adolescent Medicine Unit. However, um, the institution, uh, of course, uh, we should follow the rules and regulations for the institution. But then uh, my main, my main uh, objective uh, behind this, because uh, again, as I said at the beginning, definitely the resident or the trainees um, they can they can go and search and uh, as uh, adult learners they can have their own resources uh, um, of uh, looking at the heads assessment but then again having the heads assessment when you when you read the uh, how to do it is different it's easier said than done mm -hmm. then um, of course uh, they have to be trained um, how to do those uh, kind of those type of assessment even if uh, they observe me like like usually I give you an example of what uh, what we do in uh, in this uh, rotation so basically I uh, provide them with the material um, 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 ahead of time uh, before they join the rotation so they come prepared at least with the reading and then they observe me doing it during the clinical assessment and then on the next week or the second week of the block they start doing it themselves however uh, if this is uh, their first exposure it will be um, a lot of uh, uh, challenges and uh, and deficiencies uh, on the areas that they have to cover so this module has facilitated a lot of uh, the work in terms of the learning and training education uh, as i mentioned uh, uh, the quality of uh, the assessment that they do the uh, the quality of care provided to our patient and uh, of course uh, building the capacity uh, among our residents uh, on how to perform those uh, kind of assessments and so it's it's kind of reinforcing. Yeah, oh, yeah. fantastic. Um, here's another question, which may be um, coming from a slightly different angle. To what extent do you think that this structured assessment facilitates the consultation or is there a risk that it interferes with communication between doctor and patient? Yeah, so, uh, so usually when we are conducting the assessment, we don't look at the screen at all. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's just a kind of a framework when, mm -hmm. when they're taking the history mm -hmm. under supervision, when they're doing the assessment under supervision, mm -hmm. it's a kind of a, a framework when they start to document. So while documenting, while they're writing their findings, it's a kind mm -hmm. of helping them in their uh, th uh, pro uh, thought mm -hmm. process. So eye uh, to eye contact, it, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't uh, at all, it's always protected. Um, and uh, we don't look at the screen while sitting with our patients at all. Mm. No, that's fantastic. I, I think, think that's actually uh, is there. Yeah, yeah the women that's right. Very high standard yeah. of communication. Yeah. Yes, and I think, uh, of course, the more practice that one has, you can move around heads in all sorts of different ways. I know when I teach medical students about heads, I work with homeless young people. So home, which is always like considered to be the most neutral um, easiest topic to broach for my patients is actually some, sometimes the hardest and sometimes we don't really talk about home in great depth. Um, we, got, we can even talk about sex and drugs and, and mental health, but, you know, in, in, a, in a more, you know, the young people are more responsive to some of those questions than, than talking about home. So I think teaching adaptability and flexibility of, of the model and history taking is, is good as well. Yes, absolutely. Like, and then the, yeah. other, the other thing is the confidentiality. Like, for, like yes. I mean, mm -hmm. this, uh, like you have it, you have it posted on, um, mm -hmm. on in the patient chart, so everyone mm -hmm. has access to those. And so whenever there is a really sensitive issue yeah. that uh, we can prevent, uh, so mm -hmm. we, we don't include in this assessment. We we'll put it in a shadow file, password protected, mm -hmm. uh, related yeah. to a specific patient. So, mm -hmm. so the confidentiality also is highly. Protected on yep. those those kinds of uh, electronic mm, medical. Yeah, great. 
One final question and then we'll wrap up. Um, how do you move from training about assessment to learning about management? Um, well, um, definitely um, the training um, has many aspects. It's not only in relation of how to do the assessment, like we have a didactic uh, teaching we have uh, um, um, a curriculum uh, in terms of uh, um, the general adolescent uh, health issues uh, so they have the didactic they have uh, their presentations they have uh, the clinical practice uh, so there are lots of uh, um, um, opportunities uh, and uh, um, um, modalities how to deliver the, the curriculum uh, so they meet the, the uh, basic requirement as general pediatrician and what do they need to know about adolescent health as a general pediatrician. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Javier. All right. Well, that wraps up our, um, our session. I might ask all our presenters to put their cameras back on and... and um, so that everyone can see you and so that we can thank you all again for your wonderful, inspiring and, you know, energetic presentations. Uh, it, it, it's, it's getting late in the evening here in Sydney and I feel actually more awake than I did two hours ago. So um, thank you very, very much indeed. I, I do want to thank, they're not going to show their faces, but Dick Churchill and Molly Sullivan who are, who've been helping me in the background here while I've been I, I think I would have failed very much with, with managing this whole sharing business and managing questions. So thank you to, to you, Dick and Molly. But um, particularly to all our participants this evening, today, this morning, this afternoon, thank you very much for joining the session. Uh, and on behalf of IAAH, you know, it, it's been wonderful to have you here. Um, please take a final look at the um, chat. If you open up your chat box, because there are lots of links there's lots of information about where you can get the recording which will be available shortly on the IAAH YouTube channel and of course don't forget that in a few hours time from now I might be asleep actually but uh, in a few hours time the final session in this series of four will be on and you can click um, to register on the link and um, yes which is in the program here and also in the chat um, we're very keen here in the Education Committee of IAAH to stimulate discussion and encourage more of you to share your ideas about the best ways of educating the healthcare workforce about adolescent health globally. So if you have an idea or an innovation that you would like to be considered for inclusion in a future event, then please complete the online form. And there's a link to that as well. All of these links, the resources, the presentation will all be made available to you. So I think with that, I might wrap us up for the evening. Thank you again to everybody and look forward to seeing some of you at the next session in a few hours time and others in future sessions. And maybe hopefully all of you in Jamaica 2025. <laughs> all right. Thank you and good night, everybody. Good day. Thank you. Good morning. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.